Good afternoon, everybody. So today we will continue uh, with the topic that we started on Tuesday, that is digital business uh, strategy. Last time I introduced to you an approach to creating a digital business strategy where we saw that there could be uh, various frameworks that can guide you in formulation of a digital business uh, strategy. But all those frameworks have some elements in common. And based uh, on but picking those common elements, we came up with a generic strategy process model, which combines the, the different elements that we saw in different frameworks or different approaches to creating uh, digital business uh, strategy. And we went ahead to discuss the first step in creating a digital business strategy, and that is strategic analysis. Analysis of the internal resources of an organization, as well as external environment, as a foundation for creating your, your, your strategy. So we, we saw that it is important to start uh, your process of creating a uh, digital business strategy by making assessment of what resources you have. And uh, we talked about technological re resources that uh, a, a digital business uh, requires. We also uh, mentioned human resource and financial resources, which we will discuss uh, today. As I said la last time, when you're doing business, the market space becomes like a better field, just like in a war. In fact, the, the, the word strategy originates from, uh, has a military background. It's uh, different approaches that the army would use to fight an, an, an enemy. And likewise, when you're doing a business, you will encounter rivals, that other businesses that are doing business in the same uh, market space. So you need to have strategy to know how you can, com uh, to be able to compete in this competitive environment that is filled by other uh, businesses. And this is what we are trying to do in this topic, that is to create uh, a strategy. So we are learning an approach to how you can create a, a strategy. And the first step is strategic analysis where you do uh, assessment of external environment and internal uh, resources uh, analysis. So going back to this uh, framework, now we focus on this. And this is a, a detailed uh, uh, explanation of the various uh, aspects that uh, you, you need to, to, to look at. So last time we discussed about technological uh, resources. And today, we will continue uh, with human resources and financial uh, resources. And when we talk about human resources, this is a set of individuals who make up the workforce of an organization. In order to do activities uh, for your organization to create value, among other things, you need individuals, you need people, you need uh, human capital that will be deployed in the process of combining the other resources in order to create uh, value. Therefore, it's very important as part of your strategic analysis to assess the quality of human capital that y you have and whether the human capital you have, the individuals, the talents that your organization has are suitable for the kind of um, market you are, you are facing. And it's at, at this uh, stage you can make, a, a gives a foundation for deciding whether you, you have uh, the necessary uh, human capital, the necessary talents, the necessary skills and knowledge that are required for the kind of market that you are, you are facing. But another uh, resource that you need to consider are financial uh, resources. We know that in order to create value, you will need different forms of inputs. And for that case, there will be financial investments involved in the course of uh, doing business. And for various strategies, as we will see uh, later when you, we are faced with different strategic options, there will be some financial inv investments uh, involved, which means 
you need to assess the financial strength, the financial muscles of your uh, organization. And this includes both the, the fi uh, financial resources that you have and financial, uh, potential financial resources that you can attract, including uh, possibilities for, say, uh, acquiring uh, loans or potential investors that will be uh, interested in, in, in investing in your, in your business. So you need to make assessment of all the uh, financial resources that your, uh, your organization has or can attract as a foundation for creating a strategy. Uh, after looking at the uh, resources that, that your, your organization has, we also need to, to look at the competitive environment that you are, you are, you are facing. And in this uh, uh, part, we will look at demand analysis and competitive threats. So, we are still in strategic analysis, and we did uh, sort analysis last time, portfolio analysis. We have also looked at resources analysis. Now we will look at uh, demand analysis and co uh, competitor uh, uh, analysis. So when it comes to demand analysis, it all boils down to the importance of a customer. As the, the late Peter Drucker uh, said, it is the customer who determines what the business is. Uh, this is re uh, Peter Drucker is regarded as the, the father of modern uh, management. It means that a customer, as we all know, uh, forms uh, a, a very critical part for existence of any business. Without a, a customer, a business cannot exist. And that's why uh, as we create a strategy for a business, it is very important to make assessment of uh, demand. And that is what we call uh, demand a a analysis. It is a, a crucial uh, uh, stage in uh, creation of a uh, uh, strategy. And what uh, we do when we do a demand analysis is to assess customers or individuals who are, will be willing and able to buy our products as well as potential customers. So we are, we are making assessment of existing customers as well as prospects. And prospects are potential customers, that customers, that individuals that eventually can become customers for our, our, our business. By making a, a demand analysis, this provides a, a, a basis for the quantity that your business will supply. So demand, in the end, uh, derives the entire uh, production process. That how much you, you can produce de depends pretty much on how much you can sell. Because well, if you cannot sell, then there is no point of uh, producing. So you have to assess uh, uh, existing customers as well as customers uh, that can become uh, individuals that can become uh, 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 potential customers. When it comes to assessment of uh, competitive threats, Michael Porter's uh, classic five forces model can be quite useful. Uh, are you uh, all familiar with this? Yeah. So in this class, we will use it as a foundation for uh, making assessment of competitive threats that a digital uh, business ca ca can face. The, as we, we, it appears, uh, the five forces model consists of uh, five forces that pose a threat to any business uh, uh, profitability. So basically what it means is at any point, your business uh, profitability, according to My Michael Porter's uh, model, will be threatened by these five forces. That is, bargaining power of your buyers, threat of new entrants, bargaining power of suppliers, threat of substitutes, products, or services, and rivalry within the industry operating. That is, competition from other firms that are also operating in the same rivalry. So we will use this framework, but with a slight uh, modification. And with this modification, we will have three major uh, components. And that is 
competitive threats that your organization are uh, facing, and then threats from the buy side uh, uh, of uh, e-commerce, as well as the sell side. So we will look at uh, each one of these uh, in terms. We will start with competitive uh, threats. So the first threat that uh, your organization will face is the threat of new e-commerce entrance, just like in Michael Porter's uh, uh, model, that the threat of uh, entrance. But here we are being much more sp uh, specific uh, to the threat of uh, new e-commerce uh, entrance. And these are firms that can enter into the industry that uh, we, we operate. We all know that uh, technology, in specifically the, the internet and uh, the web technology, have in many ways lowered the barriers to entry into, into business. Y you can recall uh, the example we had last week when we discussed about uh, augmented uh, technology. The, the Chinese e-commerce grocer, Yeol Dan, that, that was able to create overnight about over a thousand virtual stores that started competing with physical stores. This means that the entry barriers to some industries today are quite low, making it very easy for new entrants uh, to come in. And this is a huge uh, threat to, to most uh, uh, businesses, especially for those uh, businesses whose products can easily be delivered online. For instance, software products such as music. These are type of products that entrants can easily uh, start uh, operations and threat uh, your business. Of course, for some other industries that require establishments of, say, manufacturing uh, base, talking about oil industry, chemical production industry, these are industries with very high entry barriers. But if you are involved in a business where the entry barriers are low, then the threat for new entrants is quite high. And you need to constantly uh, monitor your environment, scan the environment for such new entrants. But of course, even though the entry barriers for, uh, for such businesses are, are low, still usually entr entrants are faced by a what we call barriers to, to success. That is, they need to be market uh, uh, leaders when it comes to uh, customer service and execution of uh, marketing. And this applies to a startup business too. That You need to understand that uh, being able to start a business overnight, given the low barriers uh, uh, that the, the internet uh, provides, is not sufficient to become profitable. You need also to be innovative when it comes to marketing and customer s service. Another threat is uh, the threat of uh, new digital products. W with the modern technology today, we see almost every day new products are coming into the market. And this is a threat to the existing uh, businesses that uh, you, it is very uh, easy for competitors to create uh, new products as well as new entrants. And these new uh, products can pose a threat uh, to, to the existing businesses that offer certain uh, products. And again, this threat uh, is the highest when it for products whose uh, uh, fulfillment can occur over the internet. And basically, we are talking about information-based products, newspapers, magazines, books, music, software. These are the kind of businesses that are highly threatened by uh, the, the new digital products. Another threat is uh, the, the new business models. Uh, we discussed about uh, uh, business models, uh, I think, in chapter two. And that is the method through which uh, a business creates, delivers, and captures uh, value. And this has become uh, a huge uh, uh, competitive age uh, today, that most businesses today are competing through business models. So uh, it's not about just the products that you are creating, but you need to have a, a, an approach or uh, 
a competitive approach to value creation, delivery, and uh, capture. You can think about it, businesses such as uh, music. Platforms such as uh, iTunes have completely changed the way music is uh, distributed. And uh, such changes in business models or pricing uh, models are applicable in many other businesses. And uh, you need to uh, continuously scan the environment and see which uh, business models are emerging and how do they pose a threat uh, to you. And in that is not enough. You also need to innovate. You have to, to stay uh, innovative all the time. So the saying goes, uh, you either innovate or die. And one of the areas that today uh, most uh, business uh, leaders are focusing on is innovation of the business model. So besides the competitive threats where we look at new business models as a threat, new interests, and new digital progress, also there are threats that can emerge from the sell side of your, your, your business. And here are two threats. One is intermedi intermediaries, and the other one is a threat of uh, customers. If you compare it to Michael Porter's uh, model, then customer threats will be threat of the beginning power of the customers. But here we also add a threat of uh, inter in intermediaries. That is firms or individuals that are linking your business and customers. So in the context of online business, you would talk about uh, search in the inf influence of search engines, uh, affiliates, uh, sites, all those channels that we, we use to connect to our customers in one way or another could pose a threat uh, to, your, to, to your business. So starting with uh, customers, we know that today the internet has given customers so much power when it comes to selection of uh, products, price comparison, which means we, we are dealing with customers that are so much knowledgeable. And this could be a threat to your, to, to your uh, business because when customers are fa have the opportunity to uh, select, to, to make comparison, which means they have a wider choice. And that makes them uh, very uh, powerful. And it leads to what we call commod commoditization of products. That is, most products sold online become uh, compete one another, not based on features or other uh, aspects or uh, attributes of the products, but rather on uh, price. Because customers can literally move around. They have so many options to, to compare products and eventually uh, pick the one that, in most cases, offer the lower uh, price. So you need to understand that you are dealing with customers that are very much uh, knowledgeable, and you need to create your strategy in a way that gets around this. Another challenge is the challenge of intermediaries, as, as, as I said. And th these are enterprises or businesses that connect uh, your business with your customers. And today, th the biggest challenge is uh, uh, channel conflict. That is, businesses I increasingly use multiple channels when it comes to connect with uh, customers. And the use of multiple channels could result into conflict between uh, the channel uh, members. We, we talked about this uh, disintermediation where in, second or, uh, in the second uh, chapter, where we saw that the internet provides opportunity for firms to bypass distribution uh, agents. But in some cases, we may still need uh, these uh, distribution agents, which means an organization can run both uh, direct distribution that by distributing directly to customers, as well as using members of distribution uh, channels, uh, agents. Now, this could create uh, conflicts be between the cha different channels that an, an organization uses. And as a result of that, you may lose some of the uh, partners. So you need to, uh, to create uh, the right uh, balance of, of these uh, channels. And very important, you need to identify all the uh, important intermediaries for your business. Because 
we know that if your competitors uh, move ahead and create exclusive contracts with these channels, you might even be completely excluded from the market if the only way of reaching customers is through uh, intermediaries and these intermediaries have already been locked up by your competitors then literally you are excluded from that market so you need to uh, assess uh, the importance of your intermediaries solve any channel conflicts that may, may arise so that you can uh, maintain them because in some cases these uh, distribution uh, channel members are important source of competitive advantage in a, in a market. And if you can lock in some of the uh, important uh, members of a distribution channel, that creates even an advantage uh, over your competitors. And the last threat is the buy side uh, threats, and this includes two threats threats from suppliers and as we did for uh, sell side threats from intermediaries that is firms that link your organization and your suppliers so suppliers uh, as we said in the introduction of this class are those firms that provide inputs to your to to your organization so it could be raw materials services whatever that goes into the production process of your, your of your business and by threat of suppliers this we we, we refer to the uh, the pressure that suppliers can impose on your business by either raising prices of the inputs they provide the lo lowering of quality uh, uh, of the input because we know that the quality of the products you produce partly is a function of the quality of inputs that you use which means if your suppliers lower the quality of the inputs they provide to you, it's likely to Im implicate the quality of your, the products that you, you provide. Now, there are various factors that uh, ca can lead to uh, power of supply. For, for instance, in cases where you acquire your inputs from an industry, from a supplier who operates in an industry with very few uh, players, which, and you are operating in an industry where there are many players, you are faced with a situation where you have few suppliers relative to many buyers. And this gives that bargaining power to the suppliers. They can raise prices, they can choose to lower uh, quality, they can even decide to reduce the availability of their products because they know that you have lower options, you, are, you have dependence on them. But another uh, uh, challenge, uh, but problem could be that you may have specific investments involved in your relationship with suppliers. So for instance, you may have a, a, a very specific uh, electronic data interchange uh, link established uh, between you and your suppliers involving a uh, huge investment, which means the supplier has created in a way a lock-in effect that the shift of supply becomes very costly on your side, that it involves uh, higher cost to switch to another supplier. And in, in this case, the supplier will have a stronger bargaining power because you have very, uh, the possibility for you to, to switch to another uh, supplier is uh, lower. But we know uh, today the internet has reduced in many ways uh, the power of suppliers because through the internet is very easy to conduct uh, research, to look for uh, alternative uh, suppliers, make price comparison. But as, as I said, if your relationship with the supplier uh, involves some specific investments, then becomes uh, somehow uh, a, a challenge. Do you understand when I say about specific Im investments? So. For instance, uh, 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 an example, if you are a ferry operator in Norway, then you are required to provide vessels that can fit to the existing ferry terminal. And in case your, your vessels do not fit to that uh, terminal, you will be required to incur costs to modify, and that's quite uh, expensive. 
after the, the end of your contract, if someone else is bidding for those services, so for, for instance, let's assume that the contract for QN has come to an end and another tender is announced. It means that someone else that will table their tender in, uh, in order to compete with the QN will be required to provide vessels that will fit into existing infrastructure. Otherwise, they have to incur extra cost to modify. In a way, this is a sort of specific investment, that you have an asset that is suitable to a certain uh, uh, arrangement or to a certain uh, supplier. And if another supplier has to come in, that asset has to be demolished. And that is a, a cost. So when we talk about specific investment with respect uh, to suppliers, uh, those assets that we invest in, and in case our relationship come to an end, those assets become almost useless, that we cannot put them into alternative use. So although the internet provides uh, possibility for selecting uh, suppliers, for doing market research, when specific investments are involved, then that advantage is not that important. And then we have a, a challenge of uh, intermediaries, that is uh, the middlemen that are linking your organization and your, your, your suppliers. Compared to the sales side, middlemen in, on the buyer side are not as that powerful, but still you need to uh, take consideration of them. And this is especially when specific investments are involved. Now, one of the criticisms that Michael Porter's uh, uh, Five Forces model uh, uh, has faced is the fact that it has ignored the role of cooperation uh, among participants in, in a market space. The model emphasizes on the negative effects that different uh, participants may exert on your, your business. So uh, we look uh, uh, at all those uh, uh, participants as if they were our enemies. So they talk about bargaining power of uh, customers, and that is how customers can reduce your profit margin, how suppliers can reduce your profit margin, how new entrants, how rivers can re reduce your profit margin. But it ignores the, the fact that there are incidents where you can cooperate with your rivals, and the cooperation can turn out to be uh, quite uh, advantages. And uh, this is what we call uh, competition, and that is cooperation and competition. So it happens when rivals cooperate in uh, certain uh, uh, situations uh, where they have common interests. And these are some of the examples where you can cooperate with your rivals. So it's not uh, uh, that smart to look at your rivals as enemies all the time. There are cases where you can cooperate with your competitors. And one of those is uh, setting of uh, joint standards, for instance, when it comes to uh, service uh, delivery. Uh, we, we see this among uh, telecommunication uh, companies. They uh, agree on setting joint standards, uh, which makes it easy for uh, consumers to, to switch uh, companies, make it easy for service uh, delivery uh, in, join, in general. But also, you can have uh, joint uh, developments. You, you, you can make joint investments if this is in the best interest of, of each one that is participating. And one example are the car ma manufacturers, the three car manufacturers, uh, Ford, General Motors, and Daimler Chrysler, where they invested jointly on a purchasing platform. And this lowers the cost for, for everyone. Another example is joint uh, lobbying. For instance, when the government is about to introduce a new regulation, it is possible and useful, of course, to bring your force together with your competitors and bargain together. And this is what we call uh, joint lobbying, that try to persuade the government 
to change uh, certain uh, regulations or uh, legislation for, for, for that matter. And this is something that you can do with your, your uh, competitor. So the competitors, could, in, in most cases, we view as, as them as our enemies, but also uh, this approach uh, tells us that it is also possible to, to look at them as uh, people that we can cooperate with. So after looking at the uh, competitive threats, and now we will look at uh, competitor analysis, and that is uh, assessment of your, your, your competitor. Because uh, as we saw earlier, that competitors threaten our, our profits. Because these are uh, companies or enterprises that provide, or provide, uh, provide the same benefits as you, our organization. And it's very important as part of your uh, strategy creation to make assessment of your competitor. Just like uh, in a war, usually uh, armies would make assessment of their enemies. And this is what you also do in business. Uh, you cannot attack someone unless you know uh, who they are, what resources they, they have, how do they fight, how do they compete. So we, we will look at uh, how to do uh, co competitor uh, analysis. So basically, when you do uh, competitor analysis, you are trying to identify the weaknesses and strength of your, your competitors and use that information to improve uh, your uh, efforts. That is, create a business strategy, among other things, by looking at what weaknesses your competitors have and what strength uh, uh, they have. And how you do this, uh, first is uh, you need to collect the information about your, your competitors. And luckily today we have so many sources of uh, uh, information that you can learn uh, more about uh, your competitors. Of course, could start with uh, researching on the internet, but there are other information that are confidential that you will not find in the internet. You can use uh, agencies that provide uh, uh, these services. But it, in the end, it is very important to know as much as uh, you can about your competitor uh, before you can create a strategy for your, your, your business. And when you collect information, you have to do what we call resource advantage uh, mapping. And by resource advantage mapping is you look at the uh, the strength of your competitors, their weaknesses, and also you assess yourself. What resources do you have? What capabilities uh, do you have? And this includes looking at the core competencies, and that is uh, resources, including skills, technologies, that are helpful in creating customer value. So all the resources that your organization have should be benchmarked against what your uh, competitors have. And this is what we call uh, resource advantage uh, mapping. See where you are st which areas you are stronger than your competitor and which areas you are weaker than your uh, competitor. And then we are, we are moving to the next step of uh, creating a strategy, and that is setting objectives. So wh when we uh, create a strategy, it's like starting a journey. You need to identify where you are going. And in this case, it's very important to uh, have objectives. And that is, this uh, helps you to shape the, the direction of your, your, your strategy. And also, it helps you uh, as a benchmark the, to, to comparison of the results that after implementation of your, your strategy, you can look back and see what were your objectives and how much you have achieved or deviated from what, you, uh, what were your objectives. But also, it is very important uh, to have objectives because it helps you to communicate uh, goals and significance of the business that you are, you, you are, you are doing. And in most cases, as we 
we said uh, w when we talked about uh, this model, that is dynamic approach to creation of strategy, that this is not a linear process. It goes back and forth. It's an uh, interactive process. So as you are creating your objective, the objective have to reflect on the resources that you have. We, we will see uh, attributes uh, of objectives, that is smart objectives, that I will d discuss in a, in a few minutes. So you cannot create objectives that do not reflect what resources uh, you have. At some point, you have to be re realistic. And as such, the process of planning becomes interactive. That is, you also look back at the strategic analysis as you create your, uh, your objectives. And this is the uh, de detailed uh, map of the se second stage, that is strategic uh, objective. We look at uh, vision, objectives, mission of the, an organization, and so on. So we'll start looking at uh, vision and mission of an, an organization. As some of you who have, been, have taken a course in strategy, you are already aware of this. A vision is a, a mental image of, of the possible and desirable future state of the organization. So put it in very simple terms is where do you see your organization in a specified period of uh, uh, future? Whether in five years, in ten, 10 years, or whatever uh, time frame that you will say uh, for yourself. But it, it's a mental image that the picture that you create for your uh, your business. Where do you want to see uh, you, your business? And it provides a summary of the development of purpose and strategy of the organization. So a vision, where you want to see your, your, your organization, provides a drive for the objective and the activities that your business will uh, engage with. It is very uh, I important to, to have a vision because it gives you a long-term focus. You remember when we defined what a, a strategy is, and one of the aspects is future direction of an organization. And vision, that is the mental image of what your organization will be like, helps you to give that long-term uh, focus. And even when you face uh, challenges in the course of doing business, which certainly you will, always your vision will help you to stay focused. And that's very important to, uh, to, to any business. And that's why we emphasize that you need to have a vision for, for, your, for your business, because that will help you to stay focused, to, to maintain uh, the direction, the, the cause of your business. And this is true to businesses as well as to individuals, that we always uh, need to have a, a vision uh, in, in whatever you are, you are doing. Uh, and that will help you to stay strong, because under normal circumstances, always we face setbacks, we face challenges. But when you have a, a vision, you, you see yourself somewhere after a certain period of time, that helps you to stay focused. And parallel to, to, to a vision is a mission. And a mission uh, 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 of an organization is a written declaration of an organization called purpose and focus that normally remains uh, 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 unchanged over time. So basically, a mission would uh, I include uh, uh, items such, such as what markets are you intending to, to, to serve? How is it important to, to, uh, uh, to you? And which direction do you want to, 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 to follow? So it's uh, that core activity that you, are, you want your organization uh, to perform. We, we will see uh, very m examples of uh, missions from, from different uh, organizations. And basically, a detailed or, or uh, a comprehensive uh, mission statement will inc include these three aspects. That is business scope. That is, where do you want to compete? Where do you want your business to, to, to operate? Second is unique competences. It's how do you intend to compete? That how do you intend to position yourself in the market? How do you intend to differentiate yourself in the market? And lastly, 
values, and this is an, an emotional a aspect of, uh, uh, of the mission statement, and that is where do you derive inspiration for your, for your business? And in, in most cases, this will not be included. Most companies do not include this aspect, but uh, from theoretical point of view, this, if you have a, a mission statement, then it has to include all these uh, uh, aspects. But as we will see, examples from real world businesses, usually a mission statement will just be uh, a, a summary uh, of what um, a business is. And in most cases, they will usually express their ambition through the mission uh, statement. It's not as comprehensive as what the theory suggests, but if you want to do the right thing, then that's what it should be like. So here you have examples of uh, mission statements from Amazon, uh, Google, or Microsoft. Google says uh, their mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Microsoft, to enable people and businesses throughout the world realize their full potential. And there you have a, a mission statement for Amazon and uh, as well as their vision. So you, when you look at mission statements from real world businesses, usually they are very brief and comprehensive uh, in, a, in a way. So We'll go back to objective uh, setting, and we saw formulation of uh, vision and mission statement. And now we will look at different approaches to setting our objective. But uh, we have uh, one minute before one o'clock, so probably we can take a break and come back uh, after 15 minutes. <laughs>